scientist has a duty to society. He's really being paid to find out what the facts are in a number of different uh, areas. And uh, if he then doesn't uh, tell the public what the facts are, I think he's neglecting his responsibilities. That's one thing a scientist owes society, the truth, as he sees it. And I don't think he should be frightened from that by reactions by newspapers, media and so on, or uh, ill-advised students and other people who don't want to know. Even a uh, right idea is often, uh, first of all, encounters a good deal of hostility. Remember Galileo or Darwin or any of the famous scientists. Uh, obviously, if you have original creative ideas, they must be novel, and therefore the people who hold the orthodox views, must dislike it and criticize you for it. That's obvious. It always happens. So you have to have a certain degree of um, intellectual courage to keep on with it, regardless of that kind of criticism. He's one of the best known and most prolific psychologists in the world. Hans Eysenck has written more than 70 books, including bestsellers like Know Your Own IQ and Test Your Own Personality. He set up the first department of psychology in London and devised the now famous Eysenck Personality Questionnaire. Yet while he's been a professor for over 30 years, he's become notorious for championing views based, it said, on highly controversial evidence. He He's been condemned as a bigot, as a dangerous maverick, even a racist. While he says he's just presenting the facts, others question whether it's even science. When I started out in science, I felt a bit like a big friendly dog who gets kicked in the teeth uh, because of the reception that uh, original ideas uh, received by other people. I found that many people preferred their illusions to facts and were rather cross when you pointed out that the facts went in agreement with what they were thinking. Isink left Germany at the age of 18. By 39, he was professor of his own department, pursuing a career that has hotly divided critics ever since. I think Hans Isink uh, conforms particularly strongly to, to one type, that is to say, the man who can't lose any step in any argument without feeling that he's lost face. And when you get beaten in an argument by somebody who's not politically correct but almost rejoices in being politically incorrect, they hate him, and they hate him for his success and the ease at which he does things. Oh, there's no doubt about it that these critics are um, very often um, arguing from the point of view of uh, ideologies. There's no doubt about it. Um, but in, in science, you can't have two sets of facts that contradict themselves. Either he's right or he's wrong. In 1970, Isaac published his now notorious book on race and intelligence. This interpreted the results of IQ tests taken by white and black Americans. He caused an outcry. Now, it has been known for 80 years or more that in the United States there are quite marked differences in IQ between blacks and whites of about 18, 15 points of IQ. And the question really is uh, what causes it? It used to be taken for granted that the causes were environmental, but the improvement in the state of blacks uh, has never been reflected in any change in IQ. Also, there are a number of experiments to disprove some of the environmental theories. For instance, it isn't true that black children do better on tests if they're tested by blacks than by white uh, testers and so on. Even if you 
take black and white children who are, whose parents are equal in socioeconomic status and who go to the same school, there's still a difference of about 12 points. And so. so really, the only contribution I made was to summarize the evidence and to suggest that this was a very important area in which we simply didn't know the answer. And even that brought down the house on me, as it were, because some people simply didn't want to know uh, about the evidence, about the facts. They wanted everybody to say, sort of on a priori grounds, no, obviously everybody is equal. The, the race and IQ story is, is, is a fairly ugly one. Uh, people who um, normally like to think of themselves as scientists, r rigorous, uh, abandoned all rigor and scientific principle and just started to argue as politicians. And they saw this evidence that, uh, that um, black children weren't benefiting in the way that people had claimed uh, uh, from um, special educational provision and wanted to uh, confront society at large with that body of evidence and wanted to say... Uh, uh, th this doesn't prove that uh, blacks are inferior, but my God, it suggests it. Uh, and you should take note of that. And many people had that impulse. Uh, I think uh, Isaac succumbed to it uh, pretty fully, uh, but he absolutely wasn't alone. Isaac's work was seized on by the National Front. His suggestion that American blacks might be genetically inferior played into the hands of racial politics. He himself was called a racist. He was attacked at a lecture in London University. In Melbourne, students tried to prevent him from speaking. There were quite a large number of students who in some way uh, seemed to resent that the university had invited me at all and they were beating up some of the people who were trying to keep them away and finally the chairman said well maybe we better stop it and <laughs> I didn't feel emotional about it, I thought it was rather odd. The behaviour of these uh, very left-wing students was of course very similar to that which I'd encountered in Germany with the the Nazis beat up and uh, disrupted the lectures of socialists and Jewish and other people with whom they disagreed and uh, to find it over here and in Australia was really quite upsetting in a way because we always thought of uh, these countries as a home of free speech rather than this kind of fascist oppression and, uh, but it happened and uh, I think it was very much a change for the worse. Isaac had actually grown up in Hitler's Germany. There, anti-Nazis lived in fear. My background in Germany produced really maverick mentality because in the school I went to, apart from the Jewish children, all the others practically were Nazi, or at least very conservative and uh, leaning in that direction. I was the only one who was not inclined in that direction and really outspokenly anti-Nazi which could be quite a dangerous sort of thing if I hadn't been the biggest and strongest in the class I might have suffered grievously but then you don't beat up somebody's on all the school teams of tennis and uh, football and uh, so on so I managed to get by